She is only halfway through her first year as Congresswoman for South Carolina's 1st Congressional District. And already, Nancy Mace has faced some of the toughest, ergo unpopular choices, death threats, and a nation racked with societal unrest. She joins us now in studio. It's so good to see you. Not virtually this time. Right. We're actually in studio. Um, now, some of the things that I've mentioned, we'll, we'll get to that, and you've also mm -hmm. got a few bills that we want to talk about, yeah. but let's talk about your concealed weapons permit. Yeah. So you felt the need to arm yourself. Yeah. Tell us more about this. No, I, you know, during my campaign, I received threats as well, and, and everyone knows that, uh, y'all report on it too, I had vandalism on my car on one of the days of my debates back in the fall. and. When December rolled around, um, the rhetoric had ratcheted up so much that I was being threatened online on social media. Uh, you know, an individual wanted to shoot me, threatened to shoot me. And that's when in December I went and applied, took all the classes, got qualified on the range for my concealed weapons permit. And it wasn't until this vandalism at my house that I really feel like the need to wake up and say, you know what, it's time for me to start using this permit that I have. Do you, you feel safer? Do you feel safer, I feel safer, safer are, are now that I'm armed? It? Yeah, I feel safer because I'm yeah. protecting myself. Mm -hmm. And God forbid, I don't ever want to have to use a firearm ever. Uh, that's totally, you know, a last, um, last chance sort of situation. However, if I need to, I can. And for me, as a mom, it just it feels empowering. I've also taught my kids about gun safety. Mm -hmm. And I grew up around guns all of my life. My first hunting trip with my dad was when I was five. So what do you say to the people who want more gun control and who are opposed to the Second Amendment? Yeah, well, I mean, everyone, law-abiding citizens have the, the constitutional right to defend themselves, to be able to own a firearm, any firearm that they wanted to. For folks that are proponents of gun control, I would really ask you and ask them to really look under the hood, look at the contributing factors to gun violence in this country. And it's not law-abiding citizens who are following the law. These are criminals. And oftentimes they are people with very troubling mental health issues. But at the same time, we have laws put into place that, have, that are based in zero common sense. So take, for example, a bill that I've worked on with Congressman Tom Rice out of South Carolina, uh, seventh congressional district. Did you know that when you apply for a firearm and they do your background check, if you're flagged and the FBI needs to do further research into your background, they're only allowed to use a fax machine when communicating with state and local law enforcement. And, and that seems so archaic. A it's fax machine. A fax machine. What are those? I, I forgot what a I fax machine is. I haven't seen <laughs> one in 20 years. I don't own one. I don't even know how to use one. I don't know anyone that has one. I don't so think they sell the paper rolls for them I, anymore. I don't even. But you know, so our bill yeah. allows the FBI to communicate with state and local law enforcement with the phone, with email, online communication, yeah. modernizing it. But if you just sort of look under the hood, there are some very common sense measures we can take. That, that would improve where we are, particularly with background checks. That's you had to realize, though, that you were inheriting some of this when you did uh, take this yeah. office, of course, yeah. with the social unrest that we've been experiencing over the right. last year plus. But I wanted to switch gears and talk about some of the unpopular choices yeah. uh, that I alluded to in the beginning. And so one more recent one is the Confederate statues right. that you our proponent of taking them down uh, in the Capitol. Yeah, well, we're not tearing anything down. That's first off. Okay. That's sort of a misnomer there. But we are moving them, particularly like the John C. Calhoun that's in the main rotunda of the Capitol, will be moved elsewhere. I represent a district that Mother Emanuel happened in this district. And I don't believe the United States is a racist country. I don't believe South Carolina is a racist state. And I want to be able to showcase and allow the capital to move on from our country's racist history. Okay. There are many, many great leaders that the state of South Carolina could send to the Capitol Rotunda that wouldn't represent white supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, John C. Calhoun was pro-slavery. Uh, he was a big, big proponent of it and said it was you know, for the positive good of society to have slaves. And we have so many better examples of great Americans right here in South Carolina we can send better statues. The, the, and part of the irony is, too, is, is uh, you know, I, and I've told folks, like, you know, you want to ban critical race theory, right, on one hand, and we're doing that. But on the same hand, you can't keep a statue that represents racism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the moral uh, 
equivalent there. We've got to be consistent in our ideology, and we've got to move on from a racist history. We want to make sure that we continue to teach our history, but we have many better South Carolinians that really express the values of our yeah. state and our nation that we could have there. So you're not saying to erase history? No. And uh, no. it's critical race theory ideas, fighting racism with racism, so right. this is not no. this is not that. No, it's not that at all, but, but I mean, you know, we have better, take Joseph Rainey, for example. He uh, was the first black American elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He also happened to be from South Carolina. He actually represented South Carolina's first congressional district. Uh, he'd be a much better, I think, representation of our low country values, of our South Carolina values. And that's really what it's all about at the end of the day, um, is ensuring that, that whatever statue South Carolina sends up there represents our values. And we're not continuing um, you know, in th the first congressional district in Charleston itself. So this is home to Mother Emanuel. We've had a very troubling, you know, racist history in the last recent years. Walter Scott was on Rivers Avenue in Remount when that happened, and most recently had Jamal Sutherland, uh, whose family were constituents and are constituents of mine today. So I'm very cognizant of, about what I have to do to represent everybody in our district. I don't get to represent one side or the other. I have to do my best job to represent everyone. This is an excellent segue. Before we go to break, real quick, so mm -hmm. you were one of seven Republicans who refused to support your party's efforts to challenge the presidential election. I have to ask you this before mm -hmm. we go to commercial. Would you support Donald Trump should he run for president in 2024? Well, we're a long way away from that, and we have a huge crop of potential candidates from our own ambassador, Nikki Haley, to Ron DeSantis out of Florida. Uh, there have been rumors about Tim Scott, too. I mean, we will have, I believe, a really amazing crop of candidates for 2024. All right, that's a good note to end on. We're going to be back in two minutes. Welcome back. We're here with Congresswoman Nancy Mace, and I have to ask you what some of the challenges are as you move into the second half of the year when you're faced with the far left, and we're talking about the infrastructure bill and some of these other things. Yeah. So what do you foresee are some of the challenges that you're working up against as we move into the next six months? Yeah, I was really hoping and really believed that you, know, you could be nonpartisan on a transportation infrastructure committee. What we, what I have learned in my first six months, which was, which was a real eye opener for me, was that it is not nonpartisan at all, and it's been a very partisan experience, which has been really disappointing for me. Um, I think we will eventually get there, but the last time we'd heard from the White House on a bipartisan infrastructure package, 12 hours later, they flip flopped, and then the next day, and three days after that, the information and the deal kept changing. My biggest concern right now is we're, we're back to just under $1 trillion bipartisan package presented by the Senate right now. The biggest question that I have is how are we going to pay for it? Because there are rumors out there that the package pays for itself, mm -hmm. and that just simply isn't the case. So I want to make sure coming out of the pandemic that any infrastructure package we put together that we're not going to have to raise taxes to do it. Okay, perfect. First of three bills, mm -hmm. let's talk about the whistle whistleblower legislation. Yeah. So, so why is this... Uh, passion project for you. I have learned that there are many whistleblowers within the federal government that want to come forward, but the fear is that they'll be retaliated against for coming forward to, to uh, report waste, to report fraud or abuse within the federal government and its uh, agencies. And so what we want to do, what this bill does, is, is prevent that from happening. We don't want whistleblowers to be retaliated against or investigated uh, for being whistleblowers. So we want to make sure that those individuals are protected. Now, I have um, been approached by whistleblowers on fraudulent federal contracts. I've been approached about kids and migrants at the border and the issues down there. Um, there are so many issues that we get approached with. It's really been surprising to me uh, how many people want to come forward but are afraid to. That's fascinating. All right, this is a big one. The second mm -hmm. one, uh, I want to talk about cyber attacks. News just came out, an enormous one out of Russia, purportedly. Um, demanding seventy million dollars in bitcoin so here's another one mm -hmm. where you want to control and you want to promote uh, more tech savvy yeah. americans yeah. homegrown yeah. tech savvy americans so why do you think we're falling so far behind the rest of the world when it comes to 
cyberspace? We don't have the talent right now. I mean, I mean, truly, we are not getting kids ready when they're in high school, then for college, for many of these jobs. We have such a significant and severe need, and cybersecurity today really is national security. We saw that with Colonial Pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, our gas prices went up and never went back down. Just last year in 2020, there were 11 federal agencies that were targeted by hackers aligned with Russia. And so we want to make sure with this particular cyber uh, security legislation that we're protecting the data of Americans within different federal agencies. And we're going to do a study, and if it works, we will then scale up and do it across the federal government. Um, but also, we've got to make sure that we support private industry. I mean, they're getting hit left and right. We're seeing the Bitcoin ransoms yeah. um, almost every week, and it's increasing. It's not going away. And we also need to make sure, and I hope that our educational institutions, I know in the low country we're doing more about this, but getting our students ready uh, for many, many job opportunities to help us um, fight cyber, cyber attacks. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings about banning ransom payments? I mean, there's a few states out there yeah. who, who want to put an all-out ban or at least a partial ban on companies paying these ransoms. It's kind of a catch-22. Yeah. If you do, you get rid of them for a time, but then yeah. you're also feeding into their operations. Yeah, I would want to study it further. Okay. Um, one of the problems that we're having right now is that in some cases, I know this, I've talked to private industry and private companies here in the low country that have been attacked. Uh, is the federal government will sometimes sue the companies that did just that were just hacked right. and so but then they've got to go out and spend tens if not 50 50 million dollars right um, beefing up their online security and we just got to make sure we're not hurting the very companies that need protection and then on the flip side there's yeah. also tax incentives yeah. so it's a very mixed message it's a very mixed message and so we want to make sure that we're supporting industry yeah. these attacks are not going away they're increasing we've got to make sure at the federal level and then at the, you know within industry that we're giving everyone the resources and the ability to protect themselves. Uh, let's talk about Fairness and Farming Act. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of farmers here in South Carolina. Yeah. So what is this bill uh, proposed to well, do? This, this bill will protect uh, our small farmers. So right now, um, the checkoff program money is often spent from that program and given to big lobbying firms that protect big farming. Um, and a lot of small, small farmers feel left behind and their values are not represented and they're, they're, they're an extinct breed really and we want to protect small farmers um, and we want to make sure they are able to grow and not, not close down and shut down. They've been particularly hard hit during COVID-19. Yeah, got your hands full. My goodness, yeah. it's been a whirlwind so far this yeah. year and we've got six more months to go before December. Yeah. Congresswoman Nancy Mace, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you.